Let me start with the 800 pound gorilla in the room. How many here are part of a family? How many here are in charge of running a budget? It's not easy. Where's my Medicaid people? <laughs> There's one there. Was that just the one now? Everybody else has abandoned you? Boy, that sucks to be you. <laughs> you know, I complain about you a lot. <laughs> but I wouldn't want your job. Uh, everything I'm going to talk about, everything that has been talked about, takes money, right? Without money, none of this, thing, none of this works. Uh, and without enough money, if output exceeds revenue, uh, that's not sustainable. And eventually the door shut and the program dies. When you have a finite size pie, if you invite more people to the table, the only thing that does is decreases the size of the pie that you get. To the point that you might get enough to know that it tastes good, but not enough to satisfy you. And so when someone else is brought to the table, that means everybody else's piece of pie got smaller. Right? We understand that as people that run a budget. Now, I'm very pleased to hear today that the maternal health care pie in Iowa got $700 million bigger. But that's not a guarantee that that's going to be the case year after year. And so the theory that I just explained still holds. The size of the pie is fixed. It depends on the number of people we want to invite to the table. So I'm not going to go in on how you solve that, because I don't know. Uh, just know that everything I'm going to talk about takes money. Everything you've talked about today, and there were some great programs out there, takes money. And everybody has to have some skin in the game, including the patients. And I was glad to see some of the programs gave gift certificates after completion of certain requirements. That's skin in the game. Everybody has to have some skin in the game. Patients, patient families, healthcare providers, healthcare organizations, state and federal government, everybody. And it's gotta be a team effort or it's gonna fail. Guaranteed. So everything I say, if we can't work together, ain't gonna work. So, if you want the easy way of solving these problems, it only takes two things. One, give me access to one of the Treasury Department's printing presses, and two, make me king. <laughs> Since neither one of those are really likely to happen, we're only left with the hard ones. Because all the easy stuff's been done. The low-lying fruit is not on the tree anymore. It's all hard now. If I were king in a state like Iowa, and I don't know that this is possible, I would create a spoken hub system. Now, we can do this on a certain level. But if in a true spoken hub model, if I were developing this from scratch and I had the resources I needed and everybody agreed with me, which never happens, but if it did, I would pick locations where you'd have a hospital that would have everything needed for a high quality labor and delivery unit. 24 seven, physicians, well-trained nurses, anesthesia, blood bank, imaging, it'd all be there. 
And then in the outlying communities, and we've heard hints of this today, we'd have prenatal care. But they wouldn't deliver in those places because it's expensive. I, I use an analogy in previous talks. When I was a teenager, which was a long time ago, I used to ride a motorcycle and a horse. One of them I only had to feed when I was riding it. The other one I had to feed whether I was riding it or not. Running a labor and delivery is much more like a horse than a motorcycle. Dr. Wells pointed out all the things you need 24 seven. Okay? It's expensive. And maybe we can't afford to have so many delivery hospitals. But you have to have the support system if you go to that system like this. Uh, if you had, for example, and the university, I think Lastasha brought part of this up, what we're doing in their nurse midwife program. Uh, we have several nurse midwives. Their primary focus of employment is the university. That's where they do their deliveries. But they each take turns going to outreach clinics for prenatal care. But then those patients have to come to the hub for delivery. Again, if I could do that, I would, but several things make that difficult. I won't go into all of them. But one thing that makes it difficult is kind of what I call the corporatization of healthcare. Many years ago, back in 19, I think it was 75, 72 or 75, when Herman Hine first started the Iowa Statewide Perinatal Care Program. In Iowa's 99 counties, there were 144 delivering hospitals. That's probably too many. And as a result, because of low volume, many of those have closed. We're now down to 55, 56, depends on how you count it. Uh, but you're going to get to a certain point where you reach a critical mass. You've got to have so many delivery hospitals. And if you don't have as many delivery hospitals and you do the spoken hub, the next thing that you need to fit that together is a dedicated maternal transport program. Now there are dedicated neonatal transport programs in the state of Iowa. And if you look at nationwide when neonatal transport programs came on board, neonatal mortality rate dropped because they were getting those babies to the appropriate level care hospital, right? And it's to the point now where we have a preterm baby or a baby that's critically ill that's gonna be delivered but can't get to a hub, the neonatal team goes there and takes level four expertise and equipment to a level one hospital. Those people are scared to death. They don't know what to do with someone that needs level four care because that's not what they do. They provide level one care or level two care. So the neonatal transport team takes level four knowledge and equipment to that baby, stabilizes it and brings it back to the point now that they're actually starting cooling. And I won't go to, into what that is, but hypothermia to protect brain in extreme premature kids or kids that suffer from HIE en route. That's a high tech process. But they're now doing it en route. They don't wait till they get to the level four hospital to start cooling. So the question is, why can't we do the same thing for mothers? You've had a chance to read through some of these stories here. None of them are good. Those level one hospitals are scared to death when they've got a woman that's trying to die on them. And to the point someone brought up a traveling uh, blood bank. I mean, most level one hospitals might have four units of O negative blood, maybe. They have no platelets. 
None. I don't think there's a level one hospital in the state of Iowa that has platelets in their blood bank. Because their shelf life is too short. They don't use them that often. But when they need them, trust me, they need them. And if someone's in the middle of a hemorrhage and all you've got is a general surgeon or a family medicine doc that does C-sections, but maybe not quite as trained in difficult pelvic surgery, especially when your field of view keeps getting blurred by blood. You know, in an ideal world, I'd do what the neonatologists do. I'd send someone with that expertise to that hospital and help save that mother's life with all the blood, with the expertise, what they need. Now again, I'm probably talking a pipe dream. That's not cheap. Maternal trans or any transport program is not cheap. Very expensive. But if we want to save lives, we got to start thinking outside the box. Some of the other unmet areas. You've heard me talk about the workforce uh, with physicians and education and keeping them up to speed. Uh, the nurses are just as important, if not more so. I mean, I, I, was, I learned early on, and I'm grateful that I did, that a labor and delivery nurse can make your life a living hell <laughs> or a sweet memory in your lifespan when you're a trainer, when you're a resident. These people are at the bedside all the time. You go there every once in a while. You look at the fetal monitoring strip every once, they're staring at it. If they don't know what they're looking at, they're not gonna call you. You don't know what you don't know, right? They've got to be trained, but how do you train someone to deal with a high acuity, low frequency event at a low volume hospital? You don't, because those things don't happen often enough. So we have to come up with some solution where these nurses can go to a high volume hospital for a while and train and get some experience and bring that experience back to their low level hospitals. That's not easy. Like I said, all the easy stuff's gone. Do I ask a nurse, okay, you go to a hospital that does 4,000 deliveries a year for a month, and I got kids at home. So it's not easy, and it's not cheap. But somehow we gotta do it if we wanna save lives in rural communities. They've gotta be prepared for those rare life-threatening events. They need to know how to read a fetal monitor strip. And you don't get that except by experience. The workforce was exacerbated by COVID. Two things in my lifetime have changed the tra trajectory of human history dramatically. The first was 9-11, and the second was COVID. Everybody started working from home, they realize, this ain't so bad. Now they don't want to come back to work. Or, and because nobody wants to come back to work, people are paying high prices for traveling nurses and they think, oh, I can make a lot of money here. I can make a lot more money traveling than I can helping my community. We've got to change that somehow. The hospital's got enough money to pay the traveling nurses. Maybe you should just raise the salary of the nurses. I don't know. Just a thought. <laughs> but we got to do something. Uh, IMQCC is partnered with AWON, uh, and we talked about the other thing. Another unmet need. Uh, the coordination of care, and we've heard a lot about this today in the community, coordinating care and communicating. Uh, again, that's not easy to do, 
the old phrase, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing, that didn't just come about because it's never true. It's often true. And one of the questions we got online was, I as a physician, so busy, how do I know about all these things? None of us do. I learn things, I mean, I, I've been kind of in charge of a lot of maternal health initiatives in the state for 20 years, and I learned stuff today. I didn't know this stuff was out there. So how do we communicate that? How do we coordinate that? Because if you duplicate services, you've also duplicated cost, right? And we don't have the money to do that. The pie is only so big. I'd like enough to satisfy me, not just to know it tastes good. The future of Iowa AIM uh, remains uncertain. Uh, I am happy to announce we did get a grant. Uh, in fact, we've got two grants since the MHI grant, and hopefully we'll get another MHI grant uh, next spring, we are hope. Uh, that all brings in money. I mean, sometimes you think maybe it would be worth whatever organization you're talking about to just have someone, hire someone, that knows where to go and look for grants and knows how to write grants. That's their sole job. They go out and look for grants and they write grants. Uh, because the federal government dictates how big the state government's pie is and neither one of them are gonna get any bigger. Uh, so we gotta look for other sources of income. This is just an idea that John Daigle, who's the neonatal portion of the statewide perinatal care program and I put together. I don't know if this is how it's gonna end up looking. Uh, the statewide perinatal care program, like I said, got started in, I don't know, 72 or 75. I don't know if you remember Steph, but it was in the 70s. Uh, and for the last 20 years, the budget's been fixed. Steady, same, same dollar amount. Well, doctors' salaries haven't stayed the same. Nursing salaries haven't stayed the same. NIH cap, which is what our salaries are based on hasn't stayed the same. It's gone up every year. So to pay the people that run that program kind of the same amount of money every year, that means less and less is going to run the program. Or else we take less and our department subsidize the rest of what we do and that's really what's happening right now. But if you have a perinatal program, and I'm just giving it that name because I like the name, that's already written in code, and then you just put all of these other things that we're doing underneath that, IMQCC, AIM, uh, the Statewide Perinatal Care Program, the Educational Program, uh, Levels of Maternal and Neonatal Care Verification Program, put that all under there, and put the funding in there, and increase that funding through grants, through state, through federal government, and then you've got one governing body that hopefully helps the right hand know what the left hand's doing and coordinate care and not duplicate services so that we can minimize cost and improve care at the same time. I don't know, that's just uh, some thoughts that we've had. Don't know if it'll ever come to be, but uh, you know, there, it is what it is. <laughs> Unmet funding needs to do that kind of a program, it would probably, we're guessing, at least a million dollars a year to run a program like that. Uh, with the grants that we have and the grants that we've got recently, with the state and federal funding for the perinatal program, uh, for the next couple, three years, we might have close to that, not all of it. Uh, we still need to find more fund somewhere. But again, it goes back to the 800 pound gorilla in the room that I started with. It all takes resources. And we have to decide which resources are worth funding 
or which programs are worth funding and which ones aren't. And I'm not just talking in maternal health care, I'm talking across health care. I have no doubt that there's programs in health care that we fund that aren't doing anything to improve care. But we probably don't know it because we don't have a good data source. And if you don't have data, you can't analyze things very well to figure out where, where you're getting your bang for your buck. And we need to do that better across the state, not just in maternal health care, but across the gamut of health care. Healthcare is very expensive in this country. Uh, it's also very good. It's probably the best in the world. Uh, there's a reason kings and queens and leaders of other countries come to this country for their health care. We're good at what we do, but we come at a cost. It's not cheap. And uh, so I hope going forward we can solve some of these problems. Uh, so with that, I'll leave with another lighthouse picture. Uh, that's where I go to recover my sanity and do photography. And uh, relax from the stresses of every day. So that's, uh, that's one of the views I have from where I go. It's beautiful out there. Uh, Taking, maybe just in closing, it takes a lot of effort when you've got your target to hit it. And I think Sarah mentioned I do shoot recreational shooting, long distance. Uh, I don't hunt, don't see any need to. I can go to Hy-Vee and get a good slab of steak. Uh, But I've put a hole in a nine inch target from a mile out. That takes a little effort to hit something that you're aiming at. But you gotta focus on it. And you have to take a lot of things into consideration. Wind, altitude, elevation, rise or drop, humidity, even in a mile the rotation of the earth comes into the calculation. Well, we have to focus on what it is we want to do. And we have to start thinking about all the things that affect success or failure of that goal. And with the people we have in this room and others that maybe couldn't make it, I think we can do that. I think we can do that. There's smart people in here. I think we're capable of understanding a stable size of a pie, but figuring out how to make it work. It just takes dedication, which we have, enthusiasm, which we have, to get it done. So I encourage you to continue with the efforts that you put forth so far. Don't give up. I always like using the first part of Proverbs 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. We have a vision of what we want to do. Let's make it happen. And with that, I'll take any questions that you have. Sarah's going to help interpret any questions because my hearing's not what it used to be, number one. It has nothing to do with shooting. I got it from my mother, and she never shot a gun, as far as I know, in her whole life. Uh, and I got a head cold, so it's just making it twice as hard today. So, so enunciate. So she's going to translate if I can't understand what's being said. Uh, I was speaking to one of the state's autism experts, uh, and he suggested for his specialty, his issue, essentially the exact same hub and spoke model. Uh, and frankly, a lot of what I've heard today. So I'm wondering how sort of across specialties you guys might be able to partner or work through some of these things. I don't know. It's difficult. Uh, like I said, the easy stuff's been done. And, and I, 
started a thought, and I don't think I finished it when I was talking about the corporatization of, of health care. Back in the early days of the perinatal care, it, there weren't a lot of health care organizations. Uh, communities owned the hospitals and that kind of stuff, and hospitals that were in the same geographic region were oftentimes very collaborative in helping each other. And then they got bought up by two different healthcare systems, and they're not collaborators anymore, they're competitors. So they don't help each other very much anymore. They try to run each other out of business. And that doesn't help anybody. Uh, there's plenty of patients to go around. Uh, we don't need to, we just need to learn to play nice in that sandbox. But when you're talking corporate revenue, I don't, I don't know how you do that. I'm, I'm not a business person. I'm not smart enough to be one. Uh, that's why I went into medicine. Uh, but somehow we got to figure that out. Uh, so I don't know. I, I don't know how we do this. I have a virtual question. Um, it says, we need to shift from a project or program mentality to a transformational culture of maternal health care in Iowa. Um, we also have not addressed the elephant in the room, which is the current political climate in the state. What is our strategy to ensure commitment and corresponding allocation of resources so by Iowa that. State and federal delegation to implement best practice recommendations? What's the Reader's Digest version? Yeah, can you repeat that last part of it, Jen? Yes. Um, what is our strategy to ensure commitment and corresponding allocation of resources by Iowa's state and federal delegation to implement best practice recommendations? Did you get that one? <laughs> I'm just asking the question. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger right. Uh, As a parent, uh, I found that sometimes a carrot works and sometimes you need a stick. Uh, I prefer a carrot, but if they're too stubborn, sometimes you need a stick. And if a practice is shown to be, through evidence, to be best practices, then I think and I'm not one for government telling us everything we have to do. But if there's evidence that something works and saves lives, people should be forced to do that. And they either get forced to do it through incentives, for example, a gift card to a patient who finishes her prenatal and postnatal care, or possibly a healthcare insurance agency cutting the cost of medical malpractice for hospitals that have joined an AIM and successfully completed a bundle and shown improvement. Hospitals that decrease their cesarean section rate cost Medicaid less money, so maybe they should be rewarded for that. I think there's ways you can do it, uh, but one's a carrot, one's a stick. And uh, I'd prefer a carrot. I don't like getting whacked by a stick. But I think that's probably how you have to do it. I, you know, you try to convince people that evidence shows this or that. And, you know, in the 20 years I've been traveling the state, I, who do you think the hardest people is to convince to change? Hmm? It's the ob -gins. And I'm going, what the heck? Why are you giving me so much grief? The nurses, sponges, they love the stuff. Family medicine docs love it. They don't get a lot of the ACOG stuff. So when we come around and we teach them, they're like sponges. Yes, we'll do it. I, haven't, I have far less trouble getting a level one hospital to change than I do a level two or level three. It's very difficult, I, and that's sad for me to say, but it's the truth. I mean, it's what I've seen for 20 years. Uh, so some people would, like I said, work better with a carrot, and some people might require a stick. 